My dad has taught me about selflessness as I've watched him chronicle writers incessantly and obsessively. Somewhere in my 20s, it hit me. People smile when they see him coming. Even the notorious curmudgeons, the Amiri Barakas, and the Ishmael Reeds, these two giants who don't suffer fools are glad to see Eugene. In 1993, my dad won the American Book Award for his collection, The Eye and the Ceiling, Collected Poems. Named after my dad's signature poem of the same title, when The Eye and the Ceiling won an award in the 60s, it was called The Perfect Poem. My dad, Eugene Benjamin Redmond's acumen as a poetic technician would find few detractors. But what has always astounded me about him is not his lifetime of teaching and scholarly work, not his corpus of poetry, but how he has managed to consciously sidestep fame. He recently lost a good friend, Dr. Maya Angelou. She would routinely accuse him of putting other people's careers before his own. I'm not sure I totally agree with her. I do believe there is a deliberate mission to the madness. After all, his magnum opus is his book, Drum Voices, The Mission of Afro-American Poetry. This book, which is a study of black poetics, is present on every reading list in every university if one wants to earn a PhD in African American literature. Along with my dad's own poetry and his critical works, he's created another visual canon that was recently digitized by the university from which he retired. It contains over 100,000 photos of black writers in their most social and most intimate moments. This ongoing project of being a video griot sits alongside his Black Arts Movement mission to publicly love black artists for a living. One of the universals about all writers, and poets in particular, is that we are observers. And not only are we observers, but we often see more or differently than non-creatives. I know I speak for many writers who are routinely charged with going too deep when recalling childhood events <laughs> or neighborhood incidents. Well, my dad spends the majority of his life in observation mode. One part of his muse processes that through poetry, and another equal part processes that with photographs. Maybe other writers would have cashed in on their talents in a more capitalistic fashion, but what surrounds my dad's prodigious muse is a black arts movement aesthetic, a, a mission, if you will, that black art should be for us, by us, about us, and near us. When I consider the anti-capitalist bent of the movement, I better understand my father's reluctance to make pursuit of financial gain his focus. As I sit here thinking about my dad, he will have gone to celebrate Maya Angelou's homegoing. Within the last year, he's lost other good friends, namely Jane Cortez and Amiri Baraka. Each time one of these great trees fell, he traveled to grieve and celebrate with his comrades and their families getting up to assist in committing them to the ancestors. My dad is heading toward his 78th year, and I find myself calling him more often. This is the first time I've been asked to consider what I have learned from my father. 
So I guess I would have to say that my dad continues to teach me how to be an artist who's watchful, constantly in practice, and constantly in love. Thank mm -hmm. you.